आज के जैन जैन पेंटिंग्स व्याख्यान माला का आज तीसरा व्याख्यान है डॉक्टर पवन जी के द्वारा पिछले वर्ष हम लोगों को जैन मंदिर जैन क्या पूरे संपूर्ण जो भारत के मंदिर और उनकी स्थापत्य कला के चित्रों के साथ में उसका सूक्ष्म विवेचन हम लोगों ने देखा और सुना था अभी हम लोग पेंटिंग्स पर जैन पेंटिंग्स का विशेष करके यह सीरीज चला रहे हैं तो भारतीय संस्कृति में जैन पेंटिंग्स का जो योगदान है वो निश्चित रूप से इस श्रृंखला से उजागर हो सकेगा क्योंकि तो भारतीय ज्ञान परंपरा में हमारी जैन परंपरा का बहुत बड़ा योगदान है जब हम जैन चित्रकला की भी बात करते हैं तो जैन चित्रकला का भी इसमें प्रारंभिक योगदान है ऐसा लोग मानते हैं लेकिन इसके भी अभी प्रचार और प्रसार की आवश्यकता है तो मुझे पूरा विश्वास है कि जो लोग इसको सुन रहे हैं या YouTube के माध्यम से बाद में भी जो लोग इसको देखेंगे उनका बहुत ही उपकार होगा और ये दुर्लभ चित्र है यह सबके बस की बात नहीं है कि लोग इन चित्रों पर पहुंच सकते हैं या इन शास्त्रों पर जा सकते हैं तो इतने सहज रूप से बोधगम हो रहा है यह जो हमारी टेक्नोलॉजी है उसका भी चमत्कार हम लोग कह सकते हैं वेबिनार के माध्यम से हम लोगों को यह सब सुलभ हो रहा है तो मैं हम सभी की ओर से मैम का हार्दिक स्वागत करते हैं और मैम की ओर से और भोगीलाल लाल लहर इंस्टीट्यूट की ओर से भी अपने सभी श्रोताओं का भी हार्दिक स्वागत करते हैं क्योंकि इन लोगों के इसमें सम्मिलित होने से यह श्रृंखला सफल हो रही है और सार्धन हो रहा है तो इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ में आज का जैसा कि विषय है पॉम लीफ मैन स्क्रिप्ट पर मैडम विस्तार से जैन पॉम लीफ पर विस्तार से विस्तार से व्याख्यान देती हैं चित्र भी दिखाती हैं आपका इतिहास संस्कृति और दर्शन पूरा सब कुछ उसमें समावेश कर देती हैं तो इतने विधतापूर्ण व्याख्यान के लिए डॉक्टर मैम के लिए हम आमंत्रित करते हैं और अध्यक्षीय भाषण के लिए जीतू भाई को भी कहेंगे कि वो अगर आ जाते हैं तो वो अपना दो शब्द उसमें प्रस्तुत करेंगे मैम आपका हार्दिक स्वागत है और अपना धन्यवाद सर धन्यवाद जय जिनेन्द्र सभी लोगों को जो भी उपस्थित है इसको सुनने के लिए and uh, yeah we are going to start now and we'll start from where we left you can all hear me right now yes yes great let me start the slide show yeah okay so we are going to start from where we left last time so palm leaf uh, manuscripts you know those thin strips i showed you last time some of them and we also spoke about the various uh, jain texts uh, which have been illustrated and we saw some folios from these manuscripts also uh, with lot of tirthankar image different tirthankars we saw so moving on today now we will learn about uh, uh some more texts uh, as i said as we move on in this uh, you know our journey i will introduce you to some more texts uh, but today we will exclusively talk about the palm leaf paintings which are seen uh, you know in these texts and also with a more expanded view of the deities uh, ya devi devta jo bhi hum dekhte hain in Uh, Jain religion uh, of deities in the Jain pantheon, and which are also represented in uh, Jain art. Yeah, so this is what we are going to learn today. <clears throat> Now uh, you will think, why am I showing you this sculpture, right? So I showed you. I I mean, I told you uh, previously that the very first folio of the manuscript is uh, it starts with the. invocation of devi saraswati or the shruta devi you know uh knowledge is of most uh, you know uh, fundamental importance to jains uh, since the ultimate aim of uh, the religion is to gain 
omniscience or kevil gyan that will that will kind of release you know us from all karmas and also uh, knowledge that uh, gives us uh, all kinds of powers you know so saraswati also called the um, different names are uh, you know attested to her sharda bharti brahmi va vani vageshwari you know the ancient goddess of vidya or learning and music also enjoyed uh, unquestionable popularity between uh, all three ancient religions of india uh, be it uh, you know uh, hinduism or buddhism or jainism for that matter okay so we get images of saraswati right from uh, kushan period all right and she is also as shruti devta she is personified as the uh, form of knowledge and also in the uh, sacred jain scriptures it is said that uh, she is the you know she, uh, she kind of represents all the preachings of the jinas and the kevlins of all the 24 tirthankars so the dwadash ang all right the 12 anga texts are supposed to be are described as the different limbs or the hands of shruti devta while the 14 purva texts are said to be her ornaments and she presides over uh, the all the preachings of the 24 jinas as i have spoken earlier so uh, in fact the in kushan period there is a uh, uh, there was a Jain stupa at Kankli Tila, yeah, and uh, which is uh, in Mathura Museum, that image, and which is actually dated to the first, second century CE, the earliest image of Saraswati that we encounter. And what we are looking at here, this is not from uh, Kushan period, <clears throat> much later period, Vimalvasai temple, this is. Uh, 1150 CE, uh, uh, middle of 12th century. Uh, here we see Saraswati in the center uh -huh, and multi-armed. Um, she's holding, you know, her different attributes. Um, it's present in the Brambantika or the corridor of the uh, temple that I'm talking about, the Vimal Vasai temple. Okay. And let's see some of the depiction of Saraswati in the manuscript paintings. So we are looking at two <clears throat> manuscript folios, again from the same uh, uh, same manuscript I spoke about last time, the Shatkhandagam, uh, the Dhaval manuscript, the commentary on that text, palm leaf, dated 1113 CE. Uh, <clears throat> uh, because Saraswati in the Jain text was uh, visualized as the uh, personification of uh, the preaching of the jinnas with manuscript. So that always has become uh, one of the main attributes of Saraswati. Okay. And sometimes she's also given uh, equal status to that of jinnah. And this equality is evident from some images that we get from some of the uh, temples, uh, for instance, at Devgarh, you know, where she has been depicted or at the on the same level or same pedestal as the uh, the two jinnas which are shown there. So normally, as I have told you, the first folio of the manuscript starts with invocation of Goddess Saraswati. Or sometimes uh, you will find in later period, uh, you will see Namokar Mantra also. Yeah. So here I'm going to pick up some more examples of Devi Saraswati. <clears throat> So in Jain texts, there are different forms of Saraswati that we encounter. Sometimes she's shown two-armed or four-armed or multi-armed also. But thing to remember is that the Tirthankar is never shown multi-armed. I think I spoke about it earlier also. It is only the other, you know, deities in Jain pantheon like Saraswati or the Yakshas, Yakshis, the Shasan Devtas, Vidya Devis, etc., they can be shown multi-armed, all right. So here we can see uh, sometimes she's also, you know, uh, very auspicious to look at or Sudarshana also she's called beautiful, all right. And sometimes she's seated on a lotus in Lalitasan or standing like this in a Tribhanga stance. 
Tribhanga, when I say, I think everybody understands how you will see uh, Shri Krishna you know, when she is playing the flute, how he stands. So that's the Tribhanga stance. And Vahan of Saraswati in uh, Shvetambar uh, tradition, it is supposed to be a swan, uh, whereas the Digamba tradition, it is uh, she rides a peacock, right? So here, what we are looking at, uh, this uh, particular image is from uh, one text called the uh, Gyat Sutra, which is dated 1127 CE hmm, <clears throat> from Shantinath Bhandar Here she is four-handed, as you can see, and her attributes, you can see here she is holding a manuscript in one hand and an Akshmal, right? that she is holding here. And in her upper two hands, she is holding two uh, lotuses. All right. And uh, on these two sides, uh, you know, there are two uh, names which are, I mean, labeled the two characters which we can see here. Uh, probably they are the uh, donors offering prayers to the goddess with folded hands. Right. Uh, red background, very, very flat. Yellow is mostly in Jain paintings. You will find yellow or light yellow used to represent the body color and uh, green and uh, blue. Normally, they will represent the uh, garments or the costumes that uh, they wear. So here we have Saraswati from Updesh Malavritti, again, uh, dated 1234 CE, Shantinath Bhandar again. Uh, here, uh, additionally, what I, why I wanted you to show uh, uh, see this, she holds a veena in one of her left uh, upper hands. And she is seated here on a, you know, a lotus here in Lalitasan means a posture of ease. You can see the swan mount here and an Akshmal a lotus here. Very beautifully it is all uh, depicted here. So I should tell you that amongst Jains, uh, there is a special festival which is held uh, in the honor of Saraswati called the Gyan Panchami. You know? in the Shvetambar tradition, and it is called the Shuta Panchami in the Digambar uh, tradition. So besides uh, celebrating these festivals, uh, Jains also observe special uh, penances like the, uh, you know, Shrut Devta or the uh, Shrut Skanda and the Shrut Gyan Vratas, etc. Uh, Jain Acharyas, in fact, and also poets sometimes uh, they sought to acquire the Saraswat Mantra, you know, uh, a magic formula for obtaining mastery over speech. And sometimes they also did this to uh, gain some kind of uh, occult powers. Yeah. It's also called the Sobhagya Panchmi, this particular day. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> then two more Saraswatis I want you to see. Uh, uh, from different manuscripts here. You can look at uh, and see the different, man, uh, you know, attributes that she holds in her hands here. Manuscript here. And here again, in this lower hand, she's holding a manuscript, a veena with two hands she's holding, four armed. And most of the other attributes remain the same. Also, I want you to uh, concentrate on the costumes that and the uh, textiles. And what we are looking at here is the a uh, typical textile that is being produced in the region of Gujarat and Rajasthan, which is uh, bandhes or tie-dye, which is so beautifully depicted here. And the uh, indigo block-printed dhoti that she's wearing, yeah? Okay. So this is another text, Vikram Manjari Prakaran in the Shantinath Bhandar Kambay again. So in the beginning, there was perhaps only uh, one Vidya Devi, right? Uh, which is Devi Saraswati. Later in a new set of Vidya Devis, I mean, there was a new set of Vidya Devis that was added later in the Jain Pantheon. Actually, uh, Jainism identifies uh, 48,000 Vidyas, but only 16 of these are uh, known as the Mahavidyas. Uh, which are given importance. And Saraswati, of course, is the presiding deity of all these 16 Mahavidyas. Uh, so these are the class of deities that became uh, quite uh, prominent uh, during this period around uh, 10th, 11th centuries. Yeah.
So the cult of 16 Mahavidyas is also popular among Hindus and sometimes appear in the Buddhist traditions also, uh, but with a different context. The names remain, uh, some of the names are pretty much common. So Mahavidyas like Kali, Mahakali, Gauri, uh, Chakreshwari, huh, they have distinctly, you know, Vedic affiliation, I would say. And uh, some names like uh, Vajrashrankla, Vajrankusha, uh, they point towards their affiliation towards uh, Buddhism. So all these 16, uh, you know, uh, Vidya Devis can be seen depicted here in the famous uh, Dilwara temple at Mount Abu and uh, some other temples also in uh, Gujarat, like the Taranga or, you know, Kumbharia temple. Uh, it was a very, very, you know, popular practice, right? So, and Vidya Devis carried the usual attributes of the goddess of learning. It is uh, said that all the 16 Mahavidyas, in fact, uh, they always carried different attributes other than what we saw Devi Saraswati carrying, like the Veena or the um, manuscript, the Akshmal, the Lotus, etc., etc. Okay. And uh, yeah. So sometimes uh, they were, you know, associated with the Hindu Tantric goddesses also. It will also be, you know, it can be noticed that this was the period when the Jain Vidya Devis evolved uh, and it was the heyday of the Tantric uh, movement in uh, India at that time. So here you can see uh, the pillars are arranged octagonally supporting the big dome. This is the, you know, central dome of the uh, mandap. Uh, with the, you know, of course, we can't see the torrents here, the beautiful, probably in the next slide, I will show you. So ornamentation of the ceiling is, uh, of course, in the concentric circles. And these are the uh, depiction of the 16 Vidya Devis. They are standing on their respective uh, mounts here. All right. <clears throat> yes, here you can see very clearly. Uh, this is the close up here. Okay. <clears throat> And this is the other temple, the Luna Vasahi temple from same region where we can see. Uh, so some of the names of the Vidya Devis and, and some of their attributes also, yeah, Lakshan also, or things that they carry in their hands, uh, they are also common uh, with those of the uh, Yakshanis, huh, no? the Shasan Devtas that we talk about who are actually the attending deities on the two sides of the Tirthankar, the male and the, uh, his spouse, the female attendant spirits of the Tirthankar, right? <clears throat> so by worshipping uh, Vidya Devis, uh, it is said that the devotees get uh, knowledge, uh, character, uh, religious bent of mind, uh, mental qualities, etc., so this is the detail of that. Uh, yeah, these are the very beautiful torrents that I wanted you to show, the serpentine, which is very, very typical of Jain architecture. And here, so why these, this uh, depiction is important? Because it talks about the, uh, we can correlate it with the textual references that whatever is the iconography of Vidya Devis, uh, which is mentioned in the text, Identically, it is followed here with their respective ahan, as you can see there. Hmm. <clears throat> and the text actually which talks about is, is the Nirvan Kalika. Hmm. So their names are, as uh, you can see on the screen, uh, Rohini, Prajnapati, uh, Vajrashrankla, Vajrankush, uh, Aprati Chakra, which is same as the Chakreshwari in uh, the Yakshi. Huh? It has almost the same attributes here. You can see uh, Purush Dutta, Kali, Mahakali, Gauri, uh, Gandhari, then uh, Mahajwala, Manvi, Vairo, Achyupta, Mansi, and Mahamansi. Huh? These are the names of the different uh, Vidya Devis. So, here we, I'm trying to show you all the Vidya Devis which are depicted on palm leaf manuscript folio from the Ogha Niryukti. I showed you one folio last time also in the collection of uh, in you know Chani uh, near Baroda all right that's the Shastra Bhandar that is there so it contains actually this particular manuscript contains uh, not only these 16 uh, Vidya Devis but 
Also, other 19 goddesses, including 16 Vidya Devis and the Yakshas, uh, Kapadin, the Brahmashanti Yaksha, etc. So, as I said, these miniatures are of great importance because uh, they, you know, the, in the study of iconography also of the 16 Vidya Devis in the Jain, you know, Mantra Shastras, as these are their earliest representation that we can see in painting. And we just saw in the ceiling of Vimal Vasahi and the Luna Vasahi also. Okay. So besides the iconographical knowledge that we get looking at these, they also have preserved for us the then prevalent, uh, you know, I'm talking about, uh, uh, to, uh, you know, early 12th century. Uh, so I'm, uh, these are, you know, you talk, uh, you can also uh, glean from looking at these manuscript folios the prevailing, uh, you know, uh, the costumes that were prevalent, both for men and women there. And of course, here you can see very linear uh, conception of drawing and the attempts at color modeling and the um, treatment of nose, chin, etc. is very much. Uh, and of course, the protrusion of the uh, further eye, it is all uh, very well preserved as the uh, characteristics of the Jain paintings, yeah. <clears throat> and also, uh, you know, some of the uh, other specialities of these are as uh, Rohini has cow as her vahan, uh, Prajnapati has uh, peacock as its vehicle, Vajrashankla and Vajra, Vajrankusha, I said, has uh, Buddhist, as Buddhist deities, they have that affiliation. Aprati Chakra is, has attributes common to that of Chakreshwari, Yakshi. Purushdatta is the giver of boons to men. Okay, if one worships uh, her. Uh, Kali is, of course, terrible as death to enemies. Mahakali is Vahana is a man or a corpse. Uh, then Gauri sits on a lizard. Gandhari holds a musal in one hand, sits on a lotus. Uh, then we have uh, Mahajwala. Her weapons emit uh, flames. Yeah, if you follow, uh, I'm saying it in the same order. Uh, yeah, and she mounts on a lion. Uh, Manvi, uh, the mother of all mankind, sits on, uh, sits on a lotus in Bhadrasan. Vairavatya, she pacifies enmity and is, in fact, uh, one of the chief queens of Dharnendra mounted on a python. So we always uh, associate Padmavati with Dharnendra. But there is also... Another text which talks about this where Bhairotya was the chief, uh, you know, queen of Dharnendra. And Achyupta uh, is uh, untouched by sin. She mounts a horse. Uh, Mansi appears when meditated upon and also mounted, uh, she mounts a swan. Then Mahamansi is shown mounted on a lion. So these are some of the characteristics uh, that we briefly touched upon about Vidya Devis. And you can see each dhoti or the sari of different Vidya Devis is patterned in different design and which actually reflects a lot about the then uh, very highly developed, the textile industry, the block printing that was prevalent at that time and which is an ongoing tradition even today. So we'll see some of them in color now. So uh, we are looking at the yaksha, you know, Brahmashanti yaksha. So the yaksha and yakshani huh, uh, constituting a class of uh, semi-divine uh, beings of Jain pantheon are known as Shasandevta, as we know. And they are the guardian deities of the, uh, or in the, you know, or Jain order in that sense. And they are the guardians, you know, standing on both sides of the Tithankar. Uh, and of course, they are the subsidiary deities. They do not have the same um, status to that of the Tithankar. Of all the yakshas, Manibhadra and uh, Poonbhadra yakshas and the uh, Bahuputrika, uh, you know, yakshi appear to have been the oldest and the most uh, favorite ones. Yeah. So earliest yaksha yakshi figures, uh, you know, were Sar Sar Sarvanbhuti or Kuber, like and Ambika associated with the Jinnah was evolved from the very ancient forms and concept of Manibhadra, Poonbhadra Yakshas and uh, Bahuputrika Yakshi. They are all very, very old. And in fact, uh, uh, 
they are much older uh, than how they appeared in Jain pantheon. They were already existing amongst the uh, Brahmanic cult. All right. And in fact, they make their first appearance in 6th century. At that time, uh, Shravanbhuti, Dharnendra, Chakreshwari, Ambika and Padmavati. You know, these are the main deities that we uh, talk about in the 6th century. Then later, uh, between 8th and 9th century, the list of all the 24 pairs was uh, finalized, but their uh, independent uh, iconographic features were standardized much later in around 11th, 12th century. Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, as I showed you the collective representation of the 16 Vidya Devis, uh, the collective representation of 24 Yakshanis uh, and Yakshas can be seen, but the 24 yakshas have not been seen anywhere. And of course, they are shown multi-armed, uh, holding uh, various attributes. Okay. And of course, they existed in literary tradition also much earlier. And uh, they were actually considered as the presiding deity or spirits over wealth. And therefore, uh, it is apparent that the Jains who represent a mercantile or the merchant class specially uh, endeared themselves to this cult. And we all we all know, notice this being Jains that uh, how po popular uh, Yakshi uh, Padmavati is because she is the giver of uh, wealth and uh, pro prosperity. So Brahmashanti Yaksha, let's talk about him. He's the Jain counterpart of Vedic God Brahma with the swan mount here, you can see at the bottom here very clearly, uh, red background. And some of these are also labeled, which also help us in identifying these uh, particular paintings. You know? So he holds a chatra in one hand, left, he holds a star for a dand, lower right, a book. And in the left, of course, it is in the Varad Mudra, you know, uh, granting of boons. Uh, again, you can see yellow body, a blue jacket, red short dhoti he's wearing, uh, seated on a swan in a very uh, in a posture of ease, I would say. Sometimes uh, one will also find uh, shruk. Shruk is the uh, ladle or a spoon with which you offer, you know, some kind of uh, offerings to the in the yagya and akshmal ol, uh, kamandalu. Uh, when you know he's shown six armed. And the second one that you are seeing here on the right hand side is Goddess Ambika. Uh, she's with two hands. In the upper hand, she holds a, a mango branch here. Do you, do you see this? A mango branch. And in the nook of her arm, she's holding a, a baby uh, with, of course, a green sari decorated with the rosettes seated on a lion mount here. Okay. So let's see some more images of Ambika, right? <clears throat> Ambika seems to be the very popular deity amongst Jains after uh, Padmavati, right? Uh, adopted from Bahuputrika Yakshi, worshipped for getting children. Her attributes are uh, one or two boys. Sometimes you will see emphasizing her, emphasizing her maternal aspect and a mango, uh, you know, uh, branch here. You will see, and sometimes with its fruit. Uh, signifying the uh, fertility aspect huh, of the deity, fertility powers that she has. Lion mount like Durga, who is also known as Ambika no, in many parts, especially Gujarat. No, she is associated with Neminath, in fact, but otherwise also shown with other jinnas, sometimes also accompanied by uh, seven uh, dancing females, uh, Jain adaptation of the Saptamatrikas that we have. And in her, uh, <clears throat> you know, malevolent form, you know, the aggressive form, sometimes she's also shown with Vajra, Ghanta, Sword, Disc, you know, uh, Goad, Noose. So this suggests her uh, powerful aspect. All right. So, in fact, the iconography of um, Ambika matches with that uh, from the text Achar Dinkar, which is mentioned, the ritual text of the uh, Shvetambars. So with the growing influence of Tantric and Shakti worship, those in fact who believed in the supremacy of the 
uh, divine uh, femininity. Ambika's cult, in fact, um, spread, you know, very widely and proliferated and permeated with a lot of uh, tantric elements also. Here you can see her seated in Lalitasan on a cushion here, uh, fully ornamented uh, with a, you know, mukut on the head, dressed in a dhoti and scarf. In upper hands, she holds uh, two mango branches and here she holds the fruit and here, of course, she holds a baby here. So these are, of course, the uh, main attributes of uh, Ambika here. <clears throat> and you can see, a, you know, a crouching lion here also at the um, bottom. Very um, um, voluptuous, uh, haloed, I would say, uh, showing her uh, um, divinity. And uh, of course, uh, she has very um, interesting co-relationship, I would say, with the Buddhist deity Haiti, huh, who is also responsible for uh, children and the Brahmanic goddess Parvati. Yeah. Okay. Now we are looking at uh, Chakreshwari you know, on this side. Uh, sky blue background, you can see four hands holding chakras, red body color here. In contrast to what I had said earlier, the yellow body color, here she's shown in red. Uh, with golden mukut and uh, green blouse, white dhoti with black stripes seated on Garud. Yeah. Do you see Garud here? This is the uh, personified, uh, uh, you know, Garud anthropomorphic form where you can see the pointed nose and you that's how you can recognize him. And uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> here the Purush Datta, you know, Purush Datta, Vidya Devi I was talking about, the giver of boons to men. Dark red background you have. Here four hands, a sword, shield, uh, Bharat Mudra, no, giving of boons, and a bijora fruit also in one hand. Blue blouse, red Uttriya, no, dotted with white, mounted on uh, she buffalo. That's her vahan no, in Bhadrasan. Since, uh, I mean, I'm sure everybody must be wondering as to why there was this inclusion of these Yakshis or Vidya Devis in Jain Pantheon. So since uh, Jinnas have... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, they have eliminated all desires and intentions. They cannot respond to an individual's worship and as I have already explained to you that uh, uh, the worship of a jinna is the bhav worship. Right? Uh, the vitragi jinna worship is not physical, all right, or the worship of portrait of jinna, Tirthankar, but of his aggregate qualities right? of austere penances, uh, the three ratnas which we talked about, uh, and the devotee wishes to imbibe these in order to achieve what they were able to achieve. That was uh, omniscience or moksha in that sense. But at this, having said this, at the same time, uh, in a normal human being, there are other needs too. We all want a you know, good house. Some of us may want a, you know, maybe a bigger house, a farmhouse, right? And uh, yeah, a fancy car, etc., etc. So this was also... Uh, one of the, you know, uh, reasons that uh, these deities uh, made their appearance, right? And uh, we all, you know, and as I have already explained to you, these are the different deities that, uh, these subservient deities who help us in these endeavors of ours in life. And some of these deities are also associated with uh, tantric cult and the devotees worship them to acquire some kind of, you know, magical powers or occult powers also. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Then, of course, this is another uh, folio I'm showing you. Here you can see Chakreshwari with multiple arms. Oh, no? Almost, uh, I would say, uh, 18 arms uh, she's shown here. So this is the this is not the benevolent, but the malevolent form of the uh, Devi, where very, very aggressive, holding all kinds of uh, weapons in her hands she's holding. And here you can see uh, Garud here. All right. And this is, again, a very old palm leaf um, 
portfolio from uh, COBA, I was able to acquire this. Yeah. <clears throat> she's also, you can say, she's the counterpart of uh, Vaishnavi, the Brahminic deity, because of her attributes that we see. Then we come to Dhanendra Yaksha, and uh, uh, she he is the snake god who came to be associated with Parshunath, along with his queen Shakti, the, uh, Padmavati, as uh, Yaksha and Yakshi here. And this is, of course, the same uh, manuscript, the Dhaval manuscript that I showed you, a folio from there only. All right. So Dharnendra, of course, came to protect Parshana during the course of his austerities uh, from the Upsargas of Meghmalin. Huh? No, we, all of us know these stories. So these images are found right from 7th, 8th centuries, in fact. And the name of the Yaksha, you know, of Shasan, uh, Sheshnag, in fact, uh, or Nagraj, or of Brahminical uh, tradition also, it reminds us. And Kamath, who was the enemy of Parshanath, we all know, uh, for several existence, he was causing all kinds of hurdles and obstacles in his path of, uh, you know, obtaining omniscience. So, uh, mostly we will find Dharnendra and Padmavati. Um, the very idol of Parshanath is flanked by these two. Okay. Right. So this is uh, another uh, manuscript with the Padmavati here. And her vahan is Sarpakukut. Huh? It's a composite animal here, uh, uh, a cock here. And, you know, you can see the tail here in the form of a snake here. So Vivek Manjari Prakaran, again, this particular uh, mm, folio that I have got uh, from from Shantinath Bhandar Kambay, because that place has really some of the very, very old and very well guarded and protected uh, manuscript folios here. So on a cushion here, she sits with, uh, you know, four armed, fully ornamented, dressed in dhoti and scarf, you can see. Upper right hand, you can, here you can see she holds a ankush, here she holds a pasha here, and this is in Bharat Mudra and a fruit here. And you can recognize her with a snake, uh, you know, canopy on the forehead as part of her headdress here. All right. Her body is red here. And you can, of course, I showed you the, mm, the vahan of this. <coughs> okay. And sometimes we also find a similar kind of, uh, you know, uh, goddess, uh, the Mansa Devi, you know, amongst the Hindus also. All right. In fact, uh, yeah, okay. Many of the attributes that we see of these deities are uh, common with Hindu gods and goddesses. Yeah. Here, are two, you know, illustrated folios from the Dhaval manuscript I'm showing you Aksha, Yaksha Ajit and devotees. All right. Palm leaf manuscript. Then now we are going to talk about some other manuscripts. This is a Kalp Sutra and Kalkacharya Katha from Patan. Uh, this is uh, first, I mean, I would say mid, almost middle of 14th century, right? And I, as I had said, after this, the paper comes into being and we get to know, uh, come to know about a lot of paper manuscripts that were being made. So here you can see in this folio, there are two images, uh, two sadhvis here, uh, you know, they are kind of, uh, probably uh, preaching the two lay women, uh, this side, the two women devotees. And uh, this is from Gujarat, and it's a dated manuscript, you know, 1278. So this is uh, Vikram Samvat 1335. And to convert this to 1278, what do you have to do? You have to subtract uh, 57 huh, from here, because 57 is the uh, Vikram Samvat, that's when it started, no, the 57 CE. And that's why to trans uh, to convert the VS date to CE, this is the mechanism that we follow. Yeah. So these two illustrations are in fact part of the same narrative. Uh, uh, yeah, here you can see these two uh, sadhvis fully clad in white dhotis uh, with probably slight, uh, you know, border here and in con sorry in contrast to this you can see these two women fully ornamented with very fancy clothing etc etc 
So the austerity of the nuns, uh, you know, with white robes and thin borders is uh, very well, you know, balanced, I would say, or it contrasts the strikingly uh, richly clad women on this side. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is the, uh, this and the next folio that I'm going to show you has relevance to the real historic event that took place in the time of Hemchandracharya and the Siddh uh, Raj, uh, the king who was ruling from Patan. So uh, Hemchandra here at the request of King, uh, you know, Jai Simha in composing Siddh Hema Vyakran, huh, grammar. Here you can see in the top uh, folio here, uh, top register here, uh, this side, you can see the Acharya seated here with the Mupati in his hand, which means he's uh, addressing uh, the people sitting in front. And uh, one of the disciples is holding a palm leaf here. And what is written? Om Arham Namha, which is the, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, letter, uh, first words that are written on this particular Siddh Hema grammar manuscript that uh, he had composed, uh, uh, Himchandra Acharya. All right. And behind the disciple, of course, you can see two royal persons with folded hands. And it is uh, uh, the inscriptions say that one of them is Jaisimha and the bottom one is Kumarpal. In the lower register, you can see uh, uh, Kaistha was appointed. I mean, all this is historically uh, written. So that's how we can correlate the manuscript folio with uh, this uh, these kind of details. So a Kaistha was, uh, you know, appointed to teach Siddhema grammar to and ask questions to uh, different, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, different uh, students. And then uh, whoever was proficient in this, they were kind of awarded with a uh, lot of adequate gifts like silken garments, gold ornaments, umbrellas, etc. Hmm. And this is the second folio of the same series. Uh, here, Siddh Hema grammar is being carried in a procession on the elephant back here. This is the uh, two, folio number two. So in this miniature, of course, uh, there are two incidents which are depicted. On the top panel, we have, uh, uh, is, there is a Jinnah image here uh, in the temple inside. And you have the uh, Jai Singh Dev here, uh, worshipping the image inside. Uh, He's standing inside the mandap here. All right. And here in the second, uh, here you can see uh, the, there is the, the grammar which is there and the Jai Singh Dev is also mounted on the elephant holding a sword. Also, there is Siddhema grammar here on top with the, uh, with the parasol, you know, uh, kind of uh, giving it a huge honor in that sense. And there is a drummer which is seen uh, moving with the procession. There's a chori bearer at the back here. All right. Uh, Siddhema grammar is kept on a sthapna chare, hana, which is sheltered by the umbrella. In the lower register, we can see uh, the, you know, the prize distribution here, where uh, this is the teacher who's trying to, in fact, a kind of approve about the selection of the uh, pupil who was uh, kind of given all kinds of um, gifts and rewards for having proficiency in this particular uh, text, which was, uh, which was written by Hemchandrachari, right? <clears throat> now, the story doesn't end here. Okay, uh, uh, let's look at this top panel, right? This panel depicts the uh, 12th century domestic episode that I just spoke about of parading the Siddhema grammar. Uh, by the king, written by Jain, uh, you know, Hemchandracharya. And Shrikar was the name of the elephant here. All right. And uh, this particular piece was, uh, you know, exported to Indonesia in the 18th century, right? And it's a typical silk double ikat. When I say double ikat, uh, typical characteristics of the uh, Patan Patola that we get today. And I mean, it was, uh, you know, very popular at that time. And in Indonesia, it was, you know, held in very, very high esteem, right? It was uh, venerated, uh, it was worshipped, these, these kind of textiles. And 
uh, this of course uh, was then made uh, this uh, particular piece is housed in tapi museum in surat right and here you can very clearly see if you look at the, here on top do you see this thapna chari here yeah it's very interesting how uh, you know cleverly the weavers have woven the same incidents here in on textile silk Sapna Chari here, where the text is written, uh, kept here very nicely. And there is a chori bearer here. He's holding the uh, chori or the fly whisk in his hand here. And this is, of course, the uh, later creation, 2003. Uh, there are these uh, Salvi brothers in Patan who have created this particular piece. And they have kind of uh, almost uh, copied this piece, but on a much uh, smaller scale here. Right. And yeah, I was fortunate to get this piece for uh, my, you know, exhibition that I had held last year uh, on uh, Jain uh, manuscripts and the textiles that we see through them. Then this is another, uh, you know, folio from, uh, you know, where Mahavir Swami is seated in Pushpotar heaven uh, before, you know, descending on earth. And don't miss the this central, the Granthi Sthan, no? the uh, place for rubrication, for uh, tying the things together. <clears throat> so I would also like to point out that uh, it was a very common and esteemed practice for the, you know, Jain lady to have uh, canonical texts uh, prepared and presented to the Jain Acharyas and which usually they kept them in their, uh, you know, bhandars. The very rich bankers and the traders also devoted, uh, donated rather, uh, the temples also or the uh, sculptures also. And in fact, uh, it is said in Jain religion that both kinds of donations will have equal, uh, you know, efficacy or the effectiveness or the uh, religious merit that one would acquired by these kind of donations. And this was uh, such a, you know, this kind of uh, credo actually projects an interesting form of uh, socialism which existed in Jain faith, I would say. Uh, the offerings of all devotees, whether humble or, you know, big or munificent were uh, equally meritorious, I would say that. <clears throat> So we all know about the story of uh, Garb Kalyanak of Mahavir. So here what we are looking at are uh, uh, two uh, protagonists, uh, Rishabdath, huh? the Brahman Rishabdath and his uh, wife uh, Devnanda, Brahmani Devnanda. They are consulting the uh, 14 auspicious dreams. I mean, the uh, Brahmani is narrating these dreams to her husband. Uh, the 14 auspicious dreams that she, you know, saw after having conceived uh, Mahavir, right? So this is also a palm leaf folio from uh, Kalp Sutra. And of course, the story goes that uh, when Indra learns about this, he instructs Harin Gameshi for the transfer of embryo from uh, Brahmani Devnanda Zubum to Kshatrani Trishla Zubum. Huh? So Indra is supposed to be the leader leader of the Vedic deities also, is an example of Vayantara gods, like, uh, you know, nine planets that we have in amongst Jains. He's the chief attendant of all the Jinnas. Uh, main, uh, main attribute are, of course, the Vajra and Mount Aravat, the elephant that, you know, he, uh, you know, travels on. And mo in Jain uh, uh, texts, or even in sculptures, he will always be shown uh, four four armed, right? And uh, Harin Gameshi, of course, is an ancient folk deity. We know uh, divine commander of the infantry army of Indra, responsible for a safe childbirth. All right, and that's how that's why he summons Harin Gameshi for this transfer of a Mary, uh, embryo. All right, he's also the a companion of Skand Kumar in Vedic uh, religion, uh, the, who is the divine general of uh, Hindu mythology. And in Buddhism, he can also be equated to Hariti, who is also responsible for uh, childbirth, I would say that. Yeah. 
uh, here you can see lot of use of uh, gold you know so uh, to highlight the uh, color effect so the idea of using gold may have been derived from the persian manuscript uh, illustrations that uh, you know gujarat at this time was of course under the rule of muslim go governors yeah of delhi sultanate and uh, this kind of cultural intercourse with persia was uh, greatly uh, you know favored by the ruling uh, muslim aristocracy i would say uh, jain illustrators may have had occasions to see these uh, some of these persian manuscripts and that's how they were able to uh, you know incorporate this particular feature of introducing gold and also the kind of donations that were coming for the you know making of these manuscripts uh, that made you know mm, mm, the use of gold more and more uh, prevalent and don't miss the geese pattern on the dhoti of indra here holding the uh, lotus stem and we spoke about the importance of this particular motif which you will find uh, you know depicted across manuscripts in uh, jain tradition <clears throat> so eventually then uh, after the transfer of embryo here we can see uh, you know queen trishla seeing the 14 auspicious dreams so we can see shri lakshmi here seated here as one of the 14 dreams so the inclusion of shri lakshmi is image is very very you know appropriate here uh, where the principal occupation of the jains are uh, of course the trading community it is uh, goddess of wealth uh, good fortune the presiding goddess of commerce also known as uh, gaj lakshmi normally shown uh, being bathed by uh, four elephants sometimes the diggaj as they are called the rain clouds they are called she is also shown in Uh, buddhist uh, you know art also and religion and of course hindu monuments of course you will see uh, the earliest depiction of uh, 14 auspicious dreams uh, normally we find on the door lintels in the temples yeah at the door on the you know top portion of that all right <clears throat> okay so these are the four dream uh, diviners right when the queen sees 14 auspicious dreams the king siddharth you know summons the dream interpreters and they want to come and you know they tell the king and the queen how auspicious these dreams are and how uh, you know how uh, everything is going to happen for the betterment of the society for their state etc and that's how the name of the of mahavir was also kept as vardhaman at that time okay uh what i want you to notice here look at the uh, uttariyas or the upper scarves or the upper garment of these uh, dream diviners ha huh? look at the uh, bandhes pattern that you see here as i spoke about earlier also and why am i showing you this painting from ajanta the mahajanak jatak from cave one if you uh, you know closely look at the upper garment or the blouse of the dancer here you can very clearly see the same uh, you know textile which is used here and uh, this actually i can say this is the uh, earliest uh, very earliest the first visual reference that we get of this particular textile and also uh, in in terms of the text uh, the textual reference in uh, harsh uh, you know harsh charit you know by bana he calls it by the name of uh, pulakband ha huh? pulakband that's a very interesting name for the uh, same textile and this of course here we can see janma of mahavir the second panchakalyana uh, describes uh, of course um, kalp sutra talks about all the five uh, auspicious events in great deal uh, detail about mahavir and you can see a small uh, child here in the arms of the deity uh, of the queen yeah uh see kalp sutra talks about the life story of mahavir at great detail and which we will look at later when we talk about the paper manuscript illustrations so i thought why not show you something else in the uh, you know palm leaf folios whereby i'm going to show you some life events from the parshnath uh, you know uh, 
story. So this is the Dash Vaikalik Sutra, all right, in the collection of Jaisal Meir uh, Gyan Bhandar in Rajasthan. Uh, it does not bear any date, but stylistically, it, we can assign it to end of uh, 13th century, right? Uh, the gold and silver are not used in this particular, and all the miniatures, uh, in fact, in this, they represent uh, incidents from Parshanath's life. So here, of course, we are, uh, uh, been, uh, you know, is seeing uh, 14 auspicious dreams. Out of that, five are shown here and the rest, uh, uh, nine are shown on this side here. So, yeah. And here, uh, the same scene that I had shown you earlier, king and queen, they are discussing the uh, auspicious dreams with the uh, dream diviner and he's trying to explain. And here, this is the Janmakalyana of Parshanath here. And then, of course, uh, Harin Gameshi from Indra's court, uh, he is summoned to take Parshva to Mount Meru for birth ceremony and illustration. And he's attended by, you know, two chori bearers and uh, another, you know, servant in the front. There is a, you know, chhatra or parasol here, which again goes to show the uh, divine status of the uh, deity Parshanath here. All right. Uh, here we can see the illustration of uh, and bath of Parshanath uh, on Pandushila on Mount Meru. Uh, he is flanked by, you know, he sits in the lap of Indra or Shakra as he is called. Uh, both are seated in Padmasan. On two sides we have uh, other two, you know, um, devas, I would say, holding the water pitchers or, you know, different uh, uh, fragrant water with unguents. Uh, ready for the lustrous bath of the Tirthankar. Yeah? And interestingly, you can see the peaks of Mount Meru here at the bottom yeah, of the folio. Uh, here, Vama Devi, the queen, mother, is insisting Parshanath to get married. Uh, she sits on a you know, uh, low stool, which is again very uh, you know, typical feature of uh, Gujarati households. Yeah? So that's why I always say when we are looking at any piece of art or especially painting, of course, we are looking at uh, it from the mm, artistic point of view or the aesthetic point of view. But there are many other details that we can glean from these uh, folios, right? And similarly here, which is, uh, you know, Parshanath's getting married here. A beautiful pavilion is, you know, set by the King Prasenjit, you know, the father of the bright Prabhavati. And look at the construction of this wedding pavilion, the banana leaves, the, you know, uh, the row of pictures on both sides. And I, I mean, I will not hesitate to say that the very construction of the wedding pavilion today also is not very different from what we are seeing in these folios. And this, I mean, I'm talking about uh, more than uh, I mean, say seven, eight hundred years back, right? So this is the beauty of Indian tradition, which actually we do not encounter in any other part of the world, because it is whatever practices that we follow today, it is a living tradition. It is just not present in our textbooks, our you know ancient texts, for that matter. It, whatever that uh, customs and you know celebrations that we have. Uh, they are uh, living tradition, yeah. <clears throat> so here, yeah, Parshva has written after marriage. He uh, both are seated on two different elephants, and yeah, you can see the mahout huh, or the elephant rider. So very important thing I wanted to point out here: uh, the hierarchical perspective. The main protagonists are shown big, and the, look at the size of the mahout here. So this actually is very typical characteristic of uh, Jain paintings that uh, whatever is uh, you know not important they will be given a very uh, assigned very small uh, you know uh, very little space I would say that yeah uh, so this comes across very clearly here and you can see the similar thing here uh, the man of course is almost of the same proportion as Parshanath seated here. 
and look at he is seated here still he is you know much larger than this man standing here right so this kind of this anomaly i would say uh, i will i mean not even anomaly but because there is a some kind of point that they are, uh, the uh, the text or the artist is trying to drive at that these are the important uh, you know features of the painting right <clears throat> And this actually is also identified, this man standing as the Lokantic god who has come to uh, remind Parshanath of his ultimate goal of attaining omniscience and attaining moksha when he got, uh, you know, busy with his uh, family life. And of course, these are the two folios, very popular. Everybody knows about it. Uh, when, you know, Parshanath arrived on horse and uh, uh, Kamath was performing the Panjagni Tap, the four fires you can see with sun in, on the top. And of course, Parshanath orders the rescue of this serpent, which was actually about to be sacrificed in the fire, right? And uh, this particular snake, of course, was reborn as Dharnind, the king of the Nagas. And Kamat uh, was reborn as the Asur, Meghmalin, and who always, uh, you know, posed a lot of... Uh, <clears throat> hmm impediments in Parshva's, you know, uh, path uh, of attaining omniscience, yeah? In fact, I think I have missed out some, yeah, yeah, yeah. That folio should have come later. There's some discrepancy, yeah. So Parshanath, of course, uh, here he's shown renounce, uh, you know, on his way to renunciation, he overcomes all passions and announces uh, renunciation here. And here he's shown giving away his uh, possessions. Hmm. And here he is being moved in the initiation palanquin outside the city limits. Then here, of course, he plucks out his hair in Panch Mushti Kesh Lochan. And these are the austerities that I was talking about uh, with King, uh, you know, Dharnendra providing a snake canopy, uh, you know, above his head. Uh, to protect him from the um, torrential rain and the thunder that was caused by Asur Meghmalin. Hmm. And this is, of course, after having, uh, you know, performed all these kind of austerities, this is the Samvasadan, the fourth Kalyanak of the uh, Tirthankar. He delivers his first sermon here. And this is, of course, the a very uh, Subahu Katha, another Jain text, uh, where, which has many, many internal stories inside. These, in fact, these two folios represent the story of uh, Baldev Muni. Yeah. Uh, Baldev Muni, uh, dear Hiran and a charioteer who was, you know, who used to make the chariots. So the story goes that uh, Baldev Muni was uh, very handsome and his presence in the city, in fact, attracted uh, many women folk. And of course, due to this, of course, he got disgusted and he retired to the forest and started practicing uh, severe, uh, uh, you know, penance. All right. So the, you know, the denizens of the forest, all the animals among whom there was a deer who started listening to his uh, preachings. Uh, the deer always, you know, fed, uh, you know, led the Muni to the uh, travelers who offered him food, which kept... Uh, his body and soul intact or together. Uh, so in the first miniature here, you can uh, very clearly see he's shown uh, seated here <clears throat> on a rock, probably under the tree, uh, preaching to the congregation of <clears throat> various animals <clears throat> which are, who are present on the right here. And this side, uh, once the uh, there was a charioteer you know, after cutting wood in the forest, was on the on the on the verge of you know partaking his food, and that's when at that very moment, a uh, deer brought uh, Baldev Muni there, and the charioteer offered him the food that he was about to eat. In this miniature, you can see the charioteer is offering food to Baldev Muni. And finally, this is the last slide, the Ashtamangal. I spoke about them, these Ashtamangals, uh, last time also in Shwetambar uh, <clears throat> tradition. 
So to conclude, I would say it is uh, remarkable that uh, these miniatures, uh, they in fact have, uh, uh, you know, they represent all the characteristics of the Jain paintings. The drawing is angular, the physical, you know, peculiarities that I spoke about, the pointed nose, the further eye pointed chin, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, all these, they appear there and without any attempt at modeling or plasticity about colors, you know, very flat colors we have seen. Also, you may have noticed that there is, uh, you know, total lack of perspective, depth, uh, the colors used are very flat, a very static uh, representation of the figures, very minimalist, sometimes very pictographic, you know, and let's say this one, very, very pictographic, you know, uh, they lack a lot, uh, you know, they lack somewhat little aestheticity, I would say. And if there is any, it is only uh, incidental. While I, you know, say this, <clears throat> but the question rises that, where, uh, well, you know, these artists not trained or, you know, did they not know about the other artistic trends? Uh, so next lecture, when I show you some of the uh, kasht patikas from, you know, where these, uh, you know, palm leaf folios were kept secured in between those. And you will realize the very, very uh, lively depictions, you know, on these, the paintings which are done on these kasht patikas. Why? Because the artists were not, you know, hidebound when they were painting on these kasht patikas. As I said, the Jain paintings always adhere to the canonical injunctions and they could not deviate from whatever norms were set for them. But when they were painting these wooden patlis, they could, you know, give vent to their imagination. And, and that's how we get, uh, you know, uh, to see very, very beautiful, those wooden patlis and the borders decorations in these uh, manuscripts. With this, I'm going to give viram to this, uh, yeah, lecture. And yeah, we are open to any kind of, uh, questions and uh, yeah, suggestions, whatever. Yeah. मैं सभी श्रोताओं की ओर से मैं की हार्दिक तगता ज्ञापित करता हूँ. Thank you. So question आया हुआ है कि ये कोई सम सेक्ट मतलब ये सम सात सेक्ट है क्या हमारे यहाँ? It is having some सात सेक्ट. ये क्वेश्चन है श्री रूपेश जी का है. Yeah, yeah, the Shakta sect. Yeah, yeah, which actually, uh, that's why I said the tantric practices are very much closely associated uh, with the Shakta sect because that's where uh, they believe that the ultimate, uh, the you know, divine head is the feminine energy. That's the Shakta sect. Yeah. Yes. Baki sabi log to appreciate hi kar rahe hai kyunki itne दुर्लभ चित्र उनको प्राप्त हो रहे हैं तो मैं सभी की तरफ से आप या या I also want you all to enjoy these paintings because uh, you will not get to see them anywhere because they are you know uh, preserved very nicely kept in these uh, you know Jain bandars or the libraries or the museums uh, so uh, it's uh, very rare that you get to see them yes एक जोशी जी भी कोई क्वेश्चन करना चाहती हैं तो कृपया बताइए आप अनम्यूट करिए यस हम आप बोल बताइए आप प्लीज अनम्यूट करिए जी ब्योम साहब अनम्यूट नहीं हो पा रहे आप सुवर्णा जी ने हैंड रेस किया है आप बताइए आप अनम्यूट करिए मैम अपने आप को कैन यू प्लीज डू दैट ओके आई रीड इट इन द चैट या a little on the embryo transplantation. Thank you for a great lecture. Okay, so this embryo uh, 
uh, thing we will talk about in great detail when I talk about the paper manuscripts. Yeah, there you can see much uh, bigger pictures. And so, in fact, you can actually see the embryo also. A very, very uh, realistic, uh, uh, you know, depiction I will show you. So just uh, wait, bear with me for just uh, one more lecture. Later, I will show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Abhranj painting. So it is the same. Uh, yeah, there is no difference. So Abhranj is also a colloquial, I would say, another form of Prakrit only, right? So when we talk about, as I spoke about the language which was used in these paintings was Prakrit. And Abhranj is another form of Prakrit only. Yeah, it is the colloquial, uh, right? So... Uh, they are not any different from uh, the Jain paintings or the West Indian paintings or the Gujarati paintings that we have been talking about. Yeah. Jai Jinidra, madam, very nice lecture. Uh, I just want to uh, add to whatever you explained. And uh, in one of the slides where you showed uh, Parshanath Bhagwan uh, is standing and uh, uh, the features, I can relate them to... Uh, the sculptures at Mangi Tungi. So I think must be contemporary also because that's also 8th, 10th century. Uh, very, very similar Those features. sculptures are very early. You know, these we are talking middle of 12th century. Right? No, but As I can... Said, Sorry. The features, yeah. the features, yeah, yeah. the facial features and the, the body structure, uh, like one can relate because mostly what well, we find difference between south indian and north indian uh Absolutely. thing but yeah. here they are very similar like uh what i have seen at mangi tungi very true and uh, i can elaborate on that because see artists when they are trying to create anything where are they getting inspired from from their immediate you know uh environment or surrounding right, right? right. so the sculptures the human bodies, the features, the physiognomy, physiology, whatever you will see in sculptures, same will be replicated in paintings also. Right, so right. The say, artist is saying, seeing the same thing around him. So on this, actually, I want to tell you something very funny. There was uh, once, some years, few years back, I would say, uh, there was a big consignment of Santa Claus from China to USA. I know. And incidentally, when this, that consignment was opened, all the Santa Clauses during Christmas time, they all had these narrow, you know, Chinese right. eyes. Right. right. <laughs> so this further goes to just establish what I'm just, uh, you know, uh, telling you that the artist will always get inspired from his immediate surroundings. Yeah. Right, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, Ma'am, I will tell you a huge list, the bibliography I will give you. You know, once we have <clears throat> reached the end of this course, and uh, you can go and refer to all those books. Yeah, there are or, uh, of books. Yeah. Or a question is, Ashtamangal hai. Jainism mein, waise Buddhism aur Vedic mein bhi Ashtamangal hai. To uska reference aur ye kaha, Jainism ka to milta hai. Lekin Buddhism ka aur Vedic ka reference wo yeah, bhi on the, <clears throat> Yeah, in uh, their Vedic texts and Buddhist texts. Hmm. I, I can also, yeah, uh, I can get you the names of those texts also. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> there are lots of translations of Kalp Sutra, somebody has asked. Uh, I will share with you the English translation uh, book yeah, of Kalp Sutra. Somebody is interested in that. Jaydarinder, ma'am. It was a wonderful lecture. Thank you, and, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, I had one uh, small question. See, whatever uh, Ashtamangals are depicted in old paintings, 
they are generally square but nowadays or for i think last one century they are represented in a rectangular form in a series so uh, is there any is there any uh, connection or it is just a so see depiction of eight uh, these auspicious uh, symbols whether it is in a square or in a you know takti form mein rectangular form mein it depends on the uh, space available like okay. if they are depicted on the you know door of the you know temple the lintel then definitely they'll come like this one after the other sometimes you know on the door posts also the pillars also you will find then you will find them you know projected vertically so in these palm leaf folios as i said earlier they were very thin strips and it is the central portion which was the widest so normally the that central uh, space or the wider most space in the palm leaf folio was reserved to make these paintings or illustrations and that's how the you get them in square form you get these uh, you know eight auspicious symbols on the uh, on the kasht pattikas also the wooden covers you know in between which these folios were kept there again you will find rectangular uh, you know format yeah so uh, there is nothing uh, uh, i would say <clears throat> there's anything particular about behind it. there's no yeah, yeah. behind it it is yeah. just the space uh, availability of the space and how best they can be depicted <clears throat> aesthetically also yeah, yeah. thank so, you uh, thank you very much <laughs> अपना अपना करके अपना बोल रहे क्या क्या हेलो हेलो जी जी सर नाम मैम थैंक यू सो मच फॉर अमेजिंग दैट यू हैव शोन आई हैव वन क्वेश्चन एंड दिस क्वेश्चन इज नॉट विद रिगार्ड टू द पेंटिंग्स बट विद रिगार्ड टू दी शास्त्र तो आपने जैसे कि अभी हमें विद्या देवियों के बारे में बताया विद्या देवी और यक्ष यक्षिणियों के बारे में बताया तो मैम जैसे कि अगर इनके लाइफ स्पैन कुछ होते हैं क्योंकि दे आर नॉट फ्री फ्रॉम द साइकिल ऑफ डेथ एंड बर्थ तो इनके कुछ लाइफ स्पैन जरूर होते होंगे तो अगर हम जैन बिलीव के अकॉर्डिंग भगवान ऋषभ देव का समय काल देखें तो चक्रेश्वरी तो फिर बहुत पहले अपॉइंटेड की गई थी और शायद उनका तो जीवन काल खत्म हो गया होगा अब तक तो लाइक हाउ डू द जेंस वाई डू दे स्टिल वर्शिप हर या ऐसा कुछ यू नो लाइक वॉज दिस अ प्रॉब्लम दैट द जैन आचार्य फेस की हाउ डू वी एड्रेस दिस प्रॉब्लम बिकॉज दे आर स्टिल इन दिस चक्रा एंड समटाइम्स यू नो चक्रेश्वरी उनकी लाइफ स्पेन खत्म होगी एंड देन शी अगेन हैज टू रिटर्न तो फिर वो किस चक्रेश्वरी को वर्शिप करेंगे और किस को कोई भी यक्ष फॉर दैट मैटर बीट गौमुख या अपराजिता या कोई भी या कोई भी विद्या देवी भी हो तो उनका भी एक लाइफ स्पेन रहेगा सी विद माय लिमिटेड नॉलेज आई कैन ओनली से दिस आई थिंक सर इज मोर क्वालिफाइड टू आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन सो आई विल रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर विजय जी टू आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन की जो मान्यताएं हैं वो हमारी जैन परंपराओं में स्वीकार नहीं है हमारी जैन परंपरा तो कहती है कि हम उनकी बंदी तदगुण लब्ध है उनके गुणों की प्राप्ति करने के लिए ही हम लोग करते हैं और इस सामान्य रूप से व्यवहारिक जगत में हम लोग उसकी आराधना करते हैं लेकिन इस तरह की जो आप बात कर रहे हैं कि वो फिर उनका लाइफ स्पान हो उस तरह की कोई संभावना नहीं है मनोविज्ञानिक रूप से यह सिद्ध हो गया है जब हम इस तरह की कोई आराधना करते हैं तो हमको संतुष्टि प्राप्त होती है हम लोग इस रूप में मानते हैं क्योंकि हम इस, इस तरह की तीसरी शक्ति नियंत्रण करने वाले व्यक्ति को ना हम देवी देवता को हमारी मूल परंपरा स्वीकार नहीं करती है ये एक व्यवहारिक जगत है और अगर आप उसको दूसरे शब्दों में ये भी देखिए कि हम जिस समाज में रहते हैं तो जो समाज की प्रभाव भी पड़ते हैं तो उस रूप में हम उनको स्वीकार कर सकते हैं इसलिए इसको निश्चय नय की दृष्टि से नहीं समझना चाहिए इसको व्यवहारिक आप अगर समझते हैं निश्चय नय व्यवहार नय तो इसको व्यवहार जगत में इनकी आराधना की जाती है और उससे संतुष्टि भी प्राप्त होती है क्योंकि प्राणी दुखी है तो कहीं ना कहीं तो वो जाएगा अपने दुख को दूर करने के लिए तो निश्चित रूप से अभी अभिव्यक्त कर देने से और उससे भी आपको कुछ ना कुछ तो संतुष्टि प्राप्त होती है ऐसी हम लोगों की मान्यता है
बिल्कुल बिल्कुल चलिए मैं समझता हूँ कि आज बहुत अच्छा आज ये क्वेश्चन भी हो गया लोगों के ये भी एक बहुत बड़ा लाभ है इंटरेक्शन के माध्यम से हम लोग चर्चा कर लेते हैं और हम सभी उस, उस, जो इस चर्चा में भाग लिए हैं उनके प्रति भी कृतज्ञता ज्ञापित करते हैं कि बड़े मनोयोग पूर्वक वो लोग सुनते हैं और इस चर्चा में भाग लेते हैं और अगले एपिसोड के रूप में हम लोग जो है वो पाम मैनुस्क्रिप्ट पर हम लोग चर्चा करेंगे पेपर मैनुस्क्रिप्ट पर नो सो आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट द पटली कवर्स जो कास्ट पट्टिका इज है ना उनके बारे में हम बात करेंगे एंड बॉर्डर डेकोरेशन क्योंकि वो इनसे रिलेटेड हैं सो आई थॉट आई विल यू नो ब्रिंग दैट फर्स्ट या मेरे पास जो रिकॉर्ड होता है मैंने उसके अनुसार बताया सो ये पुनः सभी मैडम के प्रति कृतज्ञता ज्ञापन करता हूँ अपने समिति ओर से और सभी का मैं नाम नहीं लेना चाहता हूँ और लेकिन सबके प्रति मेरी बहुत कृतज्ञता है कि आप लोग समय निकाल करके इस कार्यक्रम को सुनते हैं निश्चित रूप से सबका इसमें लाभ होगा इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ सभी को